It's a plague! Don't let them breathe on you! Camera, 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 camera! What is going on? From building crazy, mind-blowing sets to hilarious shot-by-shot -shot comparisons of sex education and 80s movies, heartbreaking revelations from shooty and secret literature Easter eggs you didn't notice, all in our behind-the-scenes of sex education video. 80s movies versus the series You've definitely noticed that Stranger Things and Sex Education have lots of similarities concerning visual style, from missing posters to clothing and lighting. As it turns out, this is not a coincidence at all. Both shows were immensely inspired by John Hughes and his 80s movies. You'll be so surprised to see our scene-to-scene -scene comparison from Sex Education and Hughes' movies. The most obvious reference in Sex Education Season 2 was in Episode 7, when girls spend a couple of hours of detention in a school library which echoes the plot of the film Breakfast Club. Kids from totally different school gangs are forced to spend time together and finally bond in the end. Yep, the idea in both cases is basically the same. Sex Education writer revealed that she took a lot of inspiration from Hughes's 16 Candles as well. Just like Samantha, Maeve is trapped between two boys, a nerdy Otis that's obsessed with her and reminds us of Anthony Michael Hall's character, Ted, while she is in love with one of the coolest kids in the hood, who is super handsome, romantic, and dreams of having a loving girlfriend. Just like Jake Ryan from 16 Candles. Plus, let's not forget that it was Maeve's birthday in Season 2. It's kind of an obvious reference, don't you think? One more reference comes from Pretty in Pink, where the main female character is in love with a cool guy that likes her back, but keeps the relationship secret, while another guy is obviously obsessed with her, but she doesn't want to be with him. Sounds like the description of Sex Education Season 1. Just look at Maeve's hair here. It literally is pretty in pink. The most copycat scene in Sex Education comes from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, when the school director, who by the way talks exactly like Mr. Groff, is peeping in the window of Bueller's home and slips while trying. Just like Mr. Groff did when he peeps at his wife in Jin's office. Every book mentioned in the series. In the very first episode of Season 1, we spot Lily reading the Tan Girl comic book created by Jamie Hewlett, which tells the story of a girl that drives a tank which is also her home. She goes on missions and tries to stay alive in her misadventures with her mutant kangaroo boyfriend. That's exactly what Lily would read, right? In one of the episodes in Season 1, we also see a bunch of books on a table, including Silas Marner, Unaccustomed Earth, Emma, and Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, and of course Maeve's favorite, A Room of One's Own, and A Passionate Apprentice by Virginia Woolf. That's a decent introduction to feminism, right? Plus, there's a poster with Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's quote, We Should All Be Feminists. It also looks like Maeve is a big fan of Bikini Kill as their poster is hanging by her bed, but in real life, Emma Mackey prefers other music. I listen to um, a lot of Scissor. Control is one of my favorite albums. And I listen to a lot of Nat King Cole, Ella Fitzgerald. Do you recognize the location? Sex Education is shot right in the heart of rural South Wales, but we all have been wondering when it is set. I mean, just take a look at their clothes. So alongside the modern phones and gadgets, the show's aesthetic resembles the beloved 80s in many ways, and it turns out that that was intentional. As the director Ben Taylor and the show's writer Laurie Nunn explained, the 80s-inspired setting is an integral part of the narrative. Both Laureen and Ben are obsessed with American 80s teen comedies and wanted to maintain the spirit of the films they were raised on. That is why they didn't want to go for a Grange Hill style and wanted something more quote-unquote aspirational and let the jocks play American football instead of regular football. Moordale High is in fact a university. The creators of the show wanted a big, pretty building that would match the mesmerizing vast landscape of Wales and not ruin the atmosphere. They picked Caerleon Campus, which is one of the former buildings of the University of Wales in Newport. The shots of Otis's house from the outside actually belong to a facade of a B&B called the Chalet. Do you remember when Otis, his dad, and Eric went camping? Or basically any forest stroll that the characters took? Well, you've seen this forest more times than you can imagine. It's the Forest of Dean, and is featured in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, Star Wars The Force Awakens, some episode of Doctor Who, and now in Sex Education. The majestic contrast of natural green and blue creates this fantastic color scheme we love so much. As Laureen said, In my mind, Moordale is not a real place. Even though we shot the show in Wales, it's very much a fictional place. 
We see it like a teenage utopia, and I like to think of it almost like a comic book world where these teenagers exist. They have a whole team of designers and creative contractors that look at the designs every morning and build the actual parts of houses or any other locations they need, from making walls in a room to decorating Jean's working office. Heartbreaking truth from Shuti and we've finally reached the unexpected revelation from Shuti Gatwa. Shuti is already 27, 10 years older than his on-screen protege, and yet the role of Eric Effiong was his first major success. Turns out that before Shuti was cast for the series, he was almost homeless. He moved from Scotland to London when he was 21 and ended up working at the Globe Theatre, doing lots of work at the Globe Theatre. As he said, I was constantly working, but I still found it impossible to survive in London because it was so expensive. Like many other starting actors, Shuti had to pay for food, his rent, bills, travels, and on days off, he had to go to auditions. As Shuti opened up, so for five months before sex education, I was couch surfing among all my friends. I didn't have a home. I was homeless. The only thing stopping me from being on the streets was the fact I had friends. But you can use up that goodwill, or you feel scared to ask people for help. Your pride kicks in. Turns out that for his audition for sex education, he had to borrow 10 quid so he could top up his Oyster card. And that 10 pounds, kindly lent to him by a friend, changed Shooty's life for good. Shooty recalls the days when he wasn't sure where he was going to end up at, saying, I was thinking it was so mad because if someone was to see me on the street, on my way to temping at Harrods in my trench coat and brogues, because you have to be so well polished and look the part, they would never believe I was about to spend two hours on the phone to people trying to find where I could sleep that night. Now, Shuti has agreed to become an ambassador for the youth homelessness charity Centerpoint, so he can now make a difference for kids in need like he once was himself. Fashion Aesthetics Have you ever thought that absolutely every outfit that features in a frame is deliberately thought out? In a Netflix short doc about making the series, Crowd Costume Supervisor explained that he has to supervise over 1,500 outfits on set every day. Every assistant character on the set has to be dressed properly, matching the colorful palette of the main character's outfits. But the ultimate fashion icon on the show is, of course, Eric. Eric's outfits are also deliberately thought out by costume designers, but Shooty has his own fabulous sense of style. When Shooty received his role, he rushed to the department store and got a whole fancy line of makeup. He was sure he had to learn how to do makeup himself. Some nice method acting we've got there! In the Netflix fashion countdown, Shuri revealed some outfits that best describe Eric's emotional journey on the show. On the first day of school, all of Eric's worries resulted into an ill-buttoned shirt that he tried to cover up by inventing a new fashion trend, the Uncore, which of course doesn't exist. It looks like he came from the camp. It's a lot of orange. You look like you're in a cult. It's an important moment that reflects Eric's insecurities, which are later replaced with new immense confidence. His second season blue and yellow contrasting scarf that he wears to impress a newcomer from France is a reference to one of the world's famous French attributes, ethereal scarves. On top of that, Shuri is Rwandan and wanted to embrace the culture in Kigali just last year, so he was very excited that his prom outfit referenced his own African heritage. He was absolutely thrilled to stand on the set of the show in a fabulous African duoc and fascinating glitter makeup. Felt nice the day of filming to kind of just stand there on a Netflix set and stand there unashamedly. I would say this is like the piece de resistance. Snatched at the waist, gave enough room for the cake. Lily's flamboyant outfits also express how deeply she's absorbed in the search of her personality. She has too many fancy pieces that do not really match. Lily wants bits of everything because she's yet to find out what exactly she wants. It's like, yes, I know that you want to embrace a trend, but maybe choose one instead of seven. All of these things separated out, I actually would be really, really happy with. Just all of them together, it's not really working. Was thought to be a flop. In her interview with Red, the show's writer Laureen Nunn revealed that she was convinced the show was going to be a big flop. Of course, she was exaggerating. No one said for failure would write a show and screen it. But Nunn was very afraid that the audience wouldn't think the idea was good enough to give it a first view. As she said, In the lead-up to its release, I had this feeling that it wasn't going to go down well. The hook of it is so unusual. The idea of this kid giving out sex advice in a toilet cubicle. So I didn't know if people would take the leap of faith that it needed. But it was nicer, in a way, to be surprised. 40 million subscribers watched the show in the first month, proving how wrong she was doubting her talent. It's been uh, very surreal. I really didn't think that the show was going to land 
uh, in that way. So um, sort of, I don't know. I kind of felt like only my mom had kind of watched it, and then suddenly it was like loads of people wanted to talk about it, and it's just been it's just been a lovely year. Were you surprised by our list? What was an intriguing detail you picked up on? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay awesome.